So this third conference is entitled St. Joseph Prefigured in the Old Testament. Um, I'll divide this talk into three parts. The first part will look at types and figures of St. Joseph according to the saints, spiritual writers and recent authors. The second part will try to deepen some possible images of St. Joseph that we can contemplate in relation to Mary as well as to see a possible link of St. Joseph with the co-redemption and mediation of Mary. And the third part, which is more devotional, continues to look at the union of the hearts of Mary and Joseph, offering some reflections on the most chaste heart of St. Joseph in relation to other symbolic pictures found in sacred scripture. So what is a type and figure? Before we begin, it's important we understand first what we mean by a type and figure. And to understand what a type and figure of St. Joseph is, let us understand what a type and figure of Jesus is. By types and figures of Jesus, we mean certain persons or events representing the character and actions of the Messiah before his coming. They are said to be types and figures of him. Examples would be Abel, the just, Melchizedek, Isaac, the son of Abraham, the Paschal Lamb, the Manna, the Brazen Serpent, Joshua, and others, many others. The prophet Jonah is a type and figure of our Lord. Jonah remained three days and three nights in the belly of a whale. Our Lord remained three days and three nights in the tomb. So the prophet Jonah tells us something in advance about Jesus in relation to his resurrection. There are types and figures of Our Lady as well, such as Judith, who cut off the head of the third Assyrian general Holofernes. This is a prefiguration of Mary who crushes the head of the serpent. And there are other women in the Old Testament who are types and figures of Mary. There are also symbols which prefigure someone or something. So for example, in chapter 44 of the book of Ezekiel, it speaks about the gate of the sanctuary that was shut as the prophet was told, this gate shall be shut. It shall not be opened and no man shall pass through it because the Lord God of Israel have entered in by it and it shall be shut. This is in reference to the perpetual virginity of Mary. It is also important for us to understand, as one author explains very succinctly, that I quote, in Holy Scripture, dictated as it was by the infinite wisdom of God and containing many manifold meanings, it often happens that one and the same thing or person is a type of several things or persons. Or the same individual may, under one aspect or in one action, represent one person, and under another aspect and in another action, represent a different person, end quote. So we're going to provide you straight away with such an example. As there are types and figures in the Old Testament who are both types and figures of Jesus and Saint Joseph. And we should also mention how one symbol can often be a type and figure of two things. So for example, the Ark of Noah, Noah's Ark, is a figure of both the Catholic Church and the Blessed Virgin Mary. So let us now look at the first type and figure of Saint Joseph, who is also a type and figure of Jesus. Okay. I cut a part out because I thought, you know, I don't want to go on too long. But just to explain the connection with Jesus, oh sorry, I've got it written down, sorry. So the patriarch Joseph, 
Joseph, the son of Jacob, who was sold into slavery and taken to Egypt, is both a type and figure of Jesus and Saint Joseph. And throughout this conference, at time, we'll refer to him as the ancient Joseph. So we'll look first at how he is a type and figure of Jesus. Joseph was the beloved of his father, Jacob. Our Lord is the beloved of his heavenly father. Joseph was sent by his father in search of his brethren who abused him and they plotted his death, sold him to foreign merchants as a slave for a sum for 20 pieces of silver. Jesus was sent on earth to look after us and was ill-treated by the Jews, his brethren, betrayed by Judas for a son who betrayed Jesus into the hands of his enemies for 30 denarii. And Jesus was delivered up to the Romans who were foreigners. Joseph was condemned for a crime of which he was innocent. He was falsely accused and made no defense but suffered punishment due to the accuser. Our Lord was also condemned for crimes of which he was entirely innocent. Joseph was kept in bonds between two criminals when he was thrown into prison and foretold death to the one and glory to the other. Jesus was nailed to the cross between two thieves. One was condemned, the other was forgiven and promised heaven. And there are other examples of how the ancient Joseph is a type and figure of Jesus, but we'll limit it to the ones we've just mentioned. So we'll look at how St. Joseph is prefigured by the ancient Joseph. How the ancient Joseph is a type and figure of St. Joseph is explained very well by Father Edward Healy Thompson in his book, The Life and Glories of St. Joseph. Father Thompson writes, a quote, the ancient Joseph prefigured our Saint Joseph in his very name. Remember, says Saint Bernard, the ancient patriarch who was sold into Egypt and know that that man, meaning Saint Joseph, not only inherited his name, but possessed moreover his chastity, his innocency and his grace, end quote. And Father Thompson continues, Joseph in the Hebrew language signifies increase. The ancient Joseph's father loved him with a special affection in preference to all his other sons and, as proof of his love, caused to be made for him a beautiful garment richly embroidered in various colors, by which it signified that our Joseph, meaning Saint Joseph, should grow in grace and sanctity surpassing all the angels and saints. While the first Joseph, says St. Bernard, receives from God intelligence in the interpretation of dreams. We remember um, Joseph was able to interpret the dream of Pharaoh as well as um, one of the criminals in prison. So um, the first Joseph receives from God intelligence in the interpretation of dreams. To the second Joseph, he gives both the knowledge and the participation of heavenly mysteries. And we should mention that to St. Joseph, this was done also through a dream. So they're connected also by dreams. Father Thompson writes that the exaltation of the ancient Joseph to the highest rank in the court of the king of Egypt could not more perfectly figure the elevation of our Joseph, St. Joseph, to the lofty of seats in the house of the Lord and court of heaven. Some authors have interpreted Jesus' words when he said that the seats on his right and his left in heaven have already been allotted by his father as belonging to Mary and Saint Joseph. Mary on Jesus' right, Saint Joseph on Jesus' left. Father Thompson writes that, quote, Pharaoh took off his ring from his own hand and placed it on Joseph's and arrayed him in a robe of silk and put a chain of gold about his neck and made him go up into the second chariot while a crier proclaimed that all should bow and kneel, bend the knee before him and acknowledge him as governor of Egypt. Hence, this is an express figure of the second Joseph when he was constituted by God, head of the Holy Family and patron of the Catholic Church. 
So it is, as the ancient Joseph, according to the saying of Holy King David in Psalm 104, verse 21, was made by Pharaoh lord of all his house and ruler over all his possessions. The psalm actually says, he made him master of his house and the ruler of all his possessions. So, as Holy Church teaches us, the second Joseph, meaning Saint Joseph, was appointed by God lord of all his house and ruler over all his possessions. And so much the more powerful, the richer, and the more exalted as the house of Nazareth and the Catholic Church. So also the ring placed by Pharaoh on Joseph's finger was a sign of the great authority conferred on our Joseph by God. The silken robe typified the glorious gifts with which his pure soul would one day be invested. The chain of gold was the symbol of that intense charity with which his heart was ever burning." End quote. Now, in relation to the garments of the ancient Joseph, some authors have, in, have interpreted it to allude to the possible assumption of St. Joseph, and given um, Father um, Faustino has already explained um, a little bit about that, I'll leave that out. Uh, but there are some um, parts in sacred scripture where some see that as alluding to a possible assumption of St. Joseph. Now let's look at other types and figures of St. Joseph. Other types and figures of St. Joseph include Abraham's trusted servant, Eleazar, as well as Abraham himself. Mardukai, who was the uncle and guardian of Queen Esther. The last step of Jacob's ladder and a few others. As we see prefigured the fatherhood of St. Joseph, the virginity of St. Joseph, and his role as a guardian and protector of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Of these types and figures, Father Thompson writes in his book saying, we may see him, St. Joseph, also in Abraham's trusted servant, Eleazar, whom he sent to fetch a wife for his son, Isaac, from among his own kindred and who escorted her in safety to her new and distant home. That's in Genesis chapter 24. As Rebecca was a type of the Blessed Virgin, so was Eleazar a type of Saint Joseph, whose office it was to watch over and protect his immaculate spouse during a large portion of her stay on earth. Again in Mardukai, the uncle and guardian of Queen Esther, herself also a figure of Mary, we cannot fail to recognize a typical, meaning type, resemblance of the Holy Joseph, guardian and protector of the Queen of Saints and Virgin Mother of the Incarnate Son of God. In Abraham, Sarah and Isaac, the fathers recognize the Holy Family. That is, in Abraham they see Joseph, in Sarah, Mary, in Isaac, Jesus. In Genesis chapter 28, we read that the patriarch Jacob beheld in a dream a ladder which reached from earth to heaven. And on the last step of this ladder, the Lord himself was leaning. This ladder is Mary. And the last step of this ladder, says the spiritual writer Abbot Rupert, is Joseph, on whom Jesus himself in his childhood leaned. Another author, Father Binet, in his book, The Divine Favours Granted to St. Joseph, also mentions what Abbot Rupert says about Jacob's ladder, telling us that Jacob's ladder is a figure of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the different steps being the patriarchs, the kings, the princes, his ancestors, and the utmost step being St. Joseph who stands with open arms to receive and embrace the infant Messiah, the divine pupil, to whom he must serve as guardian and father." End quote. According to some authors, Isaiah prophesied of Saint Joseph in chapter 29 of the book of Isaiah. The prophet Isaiah speaks of a sealed book placed in the hands of one who is learned, who being bidding to read it should answer, I cannot, for it is sealed. This is Isaiah 29, verse 11. The passage reads, 
and the vision of all shall be unto you as the words of a book that is sealed, which when they shall deliver it to one that is learned, they shall say, read this, and he shall answer, I cannot, for it is sealed. St. John Chrysostom, commentating on this passage, says, quote, what can this sealed book be, save the most immaculate virgin? And into whose care should it be consigned? Certainly into that of the priests. And to whom should it be given? To the artisan Joseph, end quote. So according to St. John Chrysostom, St. Joseph is the one who is given the sealed book who is Mary. Jean Chalier de Gerson, a French scholar, and Chancellor of the University of Paris, who died in 1429, as well as other authors, say that further on in the book of Isaiah, in chapter 62, verse 5, St. Joseph is mentioned again. Chapter 62, verse 5 says, The young man shall dwell with the virgin, and the bridegroom shall rejoice over the bride. Gerson and others say, This is Joseph with Mary. Also in the book of the Canticle of Canticles, or Song of Songs, some authors have seen St. Joseph being presented in a couple of verses. The verse which says, My beloved feedeth among the lilies, which is from chapter 2, verse 6, has been interpreted in reference to Jesus, who is the beloved, and Mary and Joseph, the purest of the lilies. Father Edward Healy Thompson writes that, quote, the fathers of the church and other spiritual writers have seen him, St. Joseph, mystically represented under many forms and in many passages of scripture. Thus, in the canticle it is said, my beloved, that is Jesus, feedeth among the lilies. And what are these lilies, asks Abbot Rupert? Certainly after Jesus, there is none purer than Mary and Joseph, nor will there ever be. St. Francis de Sales also sees a reference to St. Joseph in the Canticle of Canticles, this time in chapter 8. St. Francis de Sales says, quote, chapter 8 speaks about um, a bulwark, which is like a defensive wall. Um, so St. Francis de Sales says, what is the glorious St. Joseph but a strong bulwark for Our Lady? Joseph was given to her as a companion in order that her purity might be more marvelously protected in its integrity under the veil and shadow of holy matrimony. If the virgin be a door, said the eternal father, we do not choose that the door should be open because it is the eastern door through which no one can enter or pass. We mentioned this verse in the beginning. Therefore, it is needful to fortify it with incorruptible wood, that is, give her a companion in purity, even the great patriarch St. Joseph, who for this reason was to surpass all the saints and angels and the very cherubim themselves in that eminent virtue of virginity. And Father Faustino explained how um, the connection with this virginity and the virginity of Our Lady and St. Joseph being predestined. The veil that covered the Ark of the Covenant is also a figure of St. Joseph. Father Thompson in his book tells us, I quote, God willed that a veil of violet, purple, and scarlet, wrought with embroidery and goodly variety, should conceal the sacred ark from the profane and divide the sanctuary from the holy of holies. This mysterious veil was a figure of St. Joseph, who was to hide from the profane the heavenly virginity of Mary and the divine origin of Jesus. So also God commanded Moses to construct over the ark the propitiatory of purest gold and to place two cherubim of gold at the sides, which, extending their wings, should guard and cover the propitiatory. This propitiatory is Jesus, and the cherubim of gold are Mary and Joseph, who guard, protect, and have care of Jesus." End quote. And, I mean, if we had more time, we could go on to speak more about the Ark of the Covenant. Um, so, if we, 
if we speak of the Ark of the Covenant in relation to Mary, to Our Lady, because Our Lady is um, the Ark of the New Covenant, the Ark of the Covenant is a type and figure of Mary, um, we can understand the possible link of Saint Joseph with the Ark of the Covenant. So inside of the Ark of the Covenant were contained three things which are a foreshadowing or a prefiguration of Jesus who will be inside the womb of Mary. The Ark of the Covenant contained the manna which came from heaven, which is a prefiguration of the Eucharist of Jesus, who is the living bread who came down from heaven. The Ark of the Covenant also contained the tablets of the law, the Ten Commandments, which are the word of God. This is a foreshadowing of Jesus, who is the Word made flesh, the Word made flesh in the womb of Mary. Jesus, who is also the supreme legislator, the supreme lawgiver. The Ark of the Covenant also contained the rod of Aaron, or the staff of Aaron, which blossomed, sprouted, to reveal that the tribe of Aaron was the tribe of priests, and Aaron was the high priest. The rod of Aaron represents the priesthood and is a foreshadowing, a prefiguration of Jesus, the eternal high priest who will be incarnate in the womb of Mary. So these three things that were inside the ark are a foreshadowing, a prefiguration of Jesus who will be inside Mary. And Mary is the ark of the new covenant, the ark of the New Testament. So the ark of the covenant is a type and figure of Mary. Now, is there a possible connection um, with St. Joseph? We'll have to, um, as far as Faustina explained in his comments, connect it to the virginity of Mary. So the rod of Aaron, which was contained in the ark, which we have said is a foreshadowing of Jesus, the eternal high priest, is not only in relation to Jesus, the rod which blossomed, but also in relation to Mary. Because as Father Stefano Maria Manelli explains in his book, Biblical Mariology, the rod which flowered without the intervention of natural causes also symbolizes Mary's virginity, fecund without the cooperation of man. And even though she conceived and bore Jesus, she remained intact. So the rod of Aaron not only represents the priesthood, but it symbolizes the virginity of Mary. And hence Mary, she is called the lily of the valleys. So we can see St. Joseph as a lily, as we saw in Canticle of Canticles, some have interpreted the lily of the fields as St. Joseph as well. Um, and a tradition has come down to us that the rod of St. Joseph sprouted, blossomed in a similar way that the rod of Aaron sprouted, which was the sign that St. Joseph was to be the husband of Mary most holy. So you have the statue of St. Joseph with a rod and lilies that blossomed. So this is a tradition that's come down to us. But some mystics have spoken about this. One of them is, this is private revelation, Venerable Mary of Agreda, um, in her work, um, in her, the approved revelations that she has on the life of the Blessed Virgin Mary. I'll read um, a bit from the mystical city of God. This is what you get for giving me time, for, um, Fra Francisco. Thank you very much. It reads that all these unmarried men gathered in the temple and prayed to the Lord conjointly with the priests in order to be governed by the Holy Spirit in what they were about to do. The Most High spoke to the heart of the High Priest, inspiring him to place into the hands of each of the young men a dry stick and to command that each ask his majesty with a lively faith to single out the one whom he had chosen as the spouse of Mary. While they were thus engaged in prayer, the staff which Joseph held was seen to blossom. And at the same time, a dove of purest white and resplendent, and resplendent with admirable light was seen to descend and rest upon the head of the saint, 
while in the interior of his heart God spoke, end quote. And the mystical city of God also tells us that at age 12, Saint Joseph had made and kept the vow of chastity. So we can see another connection, because we said that the veil that covered the ark is, um, is a symbol of Saint Joseph. But he has a certain connection to the ark in relation to the rod of Aaron, which sprouted to show that that tribe was to be the tribe of the priests and in the life of Saint Joseph, according to private revelation, his rod sprouted to show that he is to be the husband of Mary. So the high priest had to choose a husband for Mary and they gathered the men together and this was the sign. He can be connected also to that rod through Mary, as Father Serafino explained, you know, Saint Joseph's connection to the Blessed Virgin Mary. He can also be connected directly to the priesthood of Christ because Saint Joseph is himself a victim. Father mentioned this possible co-redemptive role of Saint Joseph, but it's through the the mystical priesthood of Mary, if we can call it that, or the, the mystical, spiritual, maternal priesthood. Father Serafino did his doctorate on Mary's priesthood, so you can ask him about that later on. That Saint Joseph can be connected through Mary to the priesthood of Christ. So this is a way of Saint Joseph being connected to the rod of Aaron inside the Ark of the Covenant, through the virginity of Mary, which the rod also symbolizes, and through the priesthood of Christ and the mystical spiritual priesthood of Mary. And there, there are other things on the Ark of the Covenant, but um, we'll go ahead. Now let's come to the second part of this conference. Saint Joseph in relation to the co-redemption and mediation of Mary through the union of the hearts of Mary and Joseph and some biblical symbols and figures we can contemplate through this union. Through deepening our understanding of the union of Mary and Joseph, through the Blessed Virgin Mary, we can contemplate other biblical symbols and figures of Saint Joseph in relation to her. In a way that what is said of Mary, something similar can be said of Saint Joseph. To help us understand some of the reflections we'll make in the third part of this conference, let us understand first this union of Mary and Joseph. Father Bennett in his book, The Divine Favours Granted to Saint Joseph, writes that, quote, Mary and Joseph, says Saint Bernardine of Siena, were but one heart and soul. They were two in one same mind one same affection, and each of them was the other's second self, because Our Lady and he were, so to speak, only one person. The heart of Mary with that of Saint Joseph, and the heart of Saint Joseph with that of Mary. Whoever could imagine a union so intimate, a grace so great, end quote. This union includes the union of Saint Joseph with Mary co-redemptrix. And through this union, we can deepen our understanding of Saint Joseph being prefigured by Abraham. The two hearts of Mary and Saint Joseph were so intimately linked that Saint Peter Julian Amart wrote, I quote, because Saint Joseph was associated with Mary in her glorious privileges, he also had to suffer like her and his heart, too, was pierced by seven swords. So the heart of Mary was pierced with seven swords. And because her heart is one with the heart of St. Joseph, his heart was pierced, too. So we hope this for couples, you know. If one feels pain, the other feels it as well. And let's look at the sacrifice of Abraham, um, prefiguring the sacrifice of St. Joseph. Abraham is a type and figure of Saint Joseph. Abraham offered his son Isaac to God, and through this we can also connect Abraham to the Blessed Virgin Mary, as the Passionist priest and mystic Blessed Dominic of the Mother of God wrote that, quote, Mary keeps herself immovable before the cross. She remained firm like a rock, says Saint Bonaventure. 
Her resignation was so perfect as to be, according to some erudite authors, the priest who performed the sacrifice of her divine son's life and like another Abraham, immolated the innocent victim upon the mountain, end quote. Through the sacrifice of Mary, we can understand better how Saint Joseph is another Abraham and is prefigured by Abraham, not only through Abraham, Sarah, and Isaac prefiguring the Holy Family, as we have already seen, but Abraham prefiguring Saint Joseph through Saint Joseph offering Jesus, his son, to the eternal father. We know that Saint Joseph was not on Mount Calvary, and it is believed that Saint Joseph died before Jesus began his public ministry. Mary, however, also offered Jesus to the eternal father when she offered him in the temple, and thus, in a certain sense, anticipates what she will do when she offers him on Calvary. I liked what Father Serafino said this morning when he said that Our Lady brought St. Joseph's offering on Mount Calvary because St. Joseph wasn't there. But Our Lady offers her son to the Eternal Father in the temple. Okay. So St. Joseph was not there on Calvary but was there in the temple together with Mary. Does St. Joseph interiorly offer Jesus as well, together with Mary in the temple, uniting himself to her mystical, spiritual, and maternal priesthood? We can also think of other instances in the life of St. Joseph where he offers Jesus to the Eternal Father. It's possible that God would have chosen to reveal to St. Joseph the death that Jesus was to undergo. This is just a possibility. Revealing to St. Joseph the crucifixion and how Jesus would die on the wood of the cross for the salvation of mankind. If this were so, which is, which is just a conjecture, if God chose to reveal to St. Joseph how Jesus would die, if this were so and St. Joseph was aware we can reflect on the times that Jesus helped St. Joseph in his work as a carpenter, working with wood. The same material on which he would be crucified. We can reflect on St. Joseph passing the wood to Jesus and having a deeper understanding of what that wood would mean. St. Joseph is preparing the lamb. He is preparing the victim for the sacrifice. Isaac is a type and figure of Jesus. Abraham is a type and figure of Saint Joseph. And Saint Joseph himself is a victim who offers himself. Through the figure of Abraham, in whom we can see prefigured both the offering of Mary and of Saint Joseph, we can see Saint Joseph in relation to the co-redemption. And we could speak of him having a certain co-redemptive role in the sense that he is also a victim who together with the lamb who offered himself, St. Joseph offered himself for our salvation and was chosen from all eternity to have a certain role. Father Faustino explained this, this predestination of St. Joseph. And to even have a certain mediation. So St. Joseph is chosen to have a certain mediation. This is obviously not on the same level as Mary's role in our salvation, but it would be unfair and unjust to say that St. Joseph contributed nothing whatsoever. That wouldn't be just. Now let's look at St. Joseph, the spouse of the Immaculate Conception, and his union with Mary, Mediatrix of all graces. Before we come to look at one biblical symbol which can help us to understand St. Joseph's union with Mary, Mediatrix of all graces, let us continue to deepen our understanding of the union of Mary and St. Joseph, considering how St. Joseph, through being the husband of Mary, has, in a certain sense, access to her graces. Father Binet, in writing about the abundance of graces that were to be found in the Holy House of Nazareth, writes, I quote, There it was, meaning in the Holy House, that his most holy spouse became mother of God, 
some months after their espousals. Hence the treasure of God made man, the ineffable mysteries, the torrents of grace which were found in his house and in his spouse, belonged by a double title to Saint Joseph as legitimate owner of both, end quote. Then he goes on to write that, quote, according to Saint Bonaventure, all the treasure of God and of all the angels, all the wealth of paradise was in the soul of Our Lady, end quote. Then he goes on to say, and consequently, the disposal at the disposal of her spouse. And Father Bennett, imagining Mary saying to Saint Joseph, all I have is thine, says that this communion of goods was so absolute that all which belonged to the one belonged to the other. Indeed, we should rather say that the husband was still more master of all than his wife, than the wife. End quote. So Saint Joseph is the spouse of the Immaculate Conception, the spouse of she who is full of grace. And the distribution of these graces can be seen in connection with the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Little Saint Jacinta of Fatima spoke to her cousin Lucia, saying, Tell everybody that God gives graces through the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Now, Father Burnett, in continuing to write about the union of Mary and St. Joseph, writes that, in speaking of Mary, St. Bernard and St. Bonaventure would say, she is not merely a fountain, she is an ocean. She is not merely full of grace, but full of God himself and of all the plenitude of the most holy trinity. As St. Peter Damien says, the plenitude of divinity has descended into her. And St. John Chrysostom adds, you speak to us of a brook, of a rivulet of water, while we speak to you of an abyss, which has neither bottom nor shore. But who is the master of this fountain? the owner of this ocean? Who has the keys of this abyss from which he may draw when he will and what he will? It is Saint Joseph, the general administrator and representative of the Holy Spirit on earth." End quote. Now there were some Marian saints who were great contemplatives of Mary who through a mystical gift of God were able to see Mary in everything. So they might see white and think of the purity of Our Lady. They might see the light and you might see this gentleman here and see Our Lady. The, some saints had this, one saint had this gift in particular called Saint Gerard Maiella, the Redemptorist lay brother. Saint John Hughes, that great cantor of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, was able to contemplate in different biblical symbols the Immaculate Heart. And using this more mystical and spiritual approach, this more contemplative method, which can help us in our reflection and meditation, we can contemplate in the granaries of Egypt where the grain was stored, the corn was stored, the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Through the union of Saint Joseph with Mary, the Mediatrix of all graces, and through him having a certain mediation, which is always in relation to Mary, we can contemplate Saint Joseph's liberality as being prefigured in the ancient Joseph. And in the ancient Joseph, we can see prefigured a certain distribution of graces that will be given to Saint Joseph. In a town publication of a collection of prayers in honor of Saint Joseph, there is a small section on the liberality of Saint Joseph which says that, quote, our Lord permits Saint Joseph to take from his divine treasury with full hands in order to give, it, to, give to souls the treasures of divine grace and mercy, like Joseph, the son of Jacob, who took corn from the granaries of the king of Egypt to feed his brethren and all who had recourse to him. From the heights of heaven, the king of glory speaks to us the same words as Pharaoh spoke to the starving people of Egypt, 
go to Joseph, end quote. So we come to the third part um, of this conference, which looks at the most chaste heart of Saint Joseph, the heart of King David, and the three hearts as one heart. We'll look now at one more symbol in the Old Testament, using again the more contemplative and devotional approach of Saint John Hughes. Saint Joseph is invoked as the terror of demons, and just as the harp of King David was used to put to flight the evil spirit which possessed King Saul, invoking the most chaste heart of Saint Joseph can put to flight the many evil spirits that have increased their diabolical influence in these times of crisis. In seeing in the harp of King David an image of the most chaste heart of Saint Joseph, we can contemplate the heart of Saint Joseph in the heart of St. Joseph, a beautiful song and beautiful music that issues forth from the most chaste heart. A song that calls many souls to a life of chastity and purity. A song that calls souls to a life of fidelity and holiness. This call to fidelity and holiness includes the call of the most chaste heart of St. Joseph in relation to married couples as well. We can contemplate the harp of King David as a symbolic picture of the most chaste heart of Saint Joseph, also in relation to the union of the Immaculate Heart of Mary and the most chaste heart of Saint Joseph, a union which, in a certain sense, makes them one heart. Saint John Hughes, in his book, The Admirable Heart of Mary, describes the harp of King David as being, uh-oh, as being a symbolic picture of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. St. John Eudes writes that, quote, the mysterious harp of King David mentioned in several passages of sacred scripture is another symbolic picture of the Holy Heart of Mary. Sacred scripture tells us King David employed his harp especially on four great occasions and we see Jesus, the son of David, using his mystical harp to accomplish four infinitely greater achievements. In the first instance, David, the man of God, by the mere sound of his harp, put to flight the evil spirit which possessed Saul. The prophet David also employed his harp to sing many psalms and canticles to the honor and glory of God. The third purpose was to praise God and especially to praise him with joy. King David chose as the fourth function of his harp to excite and attract other men to the praise of God with hearts full of joy and gladness like his own." End quote. St. John Hughes goes on to say that the mysterious heart of David, which can be a symbolic picture of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, which Jesus uses as his own mystical heart, is also the sacred heart of Jesus, or that the heart that Jesus uses is his own sacred heart. St. John Hughes writes, quote, his first and sovereign heart is his own sacred heart, end quote. Then on speaking of the union of the sacred heart of Jesus and the immaculate heart of Mary, he writes, quote, these two hearts and these two harps are nevertheless so closely attuned that in a certain sense, they constitute one single harp, vibrating in unison, giving forth but one sound and one song, singing the same canticle of love, end quote. If we remember what was said about the heart of Saint Joseph being pierced also with seven swords in relation to him participating in some of Mary's privileges, as well as what was said about the two hearts of Mary and Joseph being one, we can also apply what we have heard in relation to the hearts of Jesus and Mary to the hearts of Mary and Saint Joseph, and can also contemplate in the harp of King David the most chaste heart of St. Joseph. In addition to this, St. John Eude says that the hearts of the angels and saints are also harps that have been given to Jesus. And as St. Joseph um, 
after the Blessed Virgin Mary is raised above all the angels and saints, surely we can say that his most chaste heart is also a heart. And St. John Eudes writes that, quote, the eternal father gave his designed son innumerable other harps, namely the harps of all the angels and saints. These are the harps mentioned in several passages of the apocalypse, where St. John tells us that God permitted him to behold the saints all holding harps on which they sang many canticles in honor of the Lamb of God. End quote. I hope you can understand the distinction between hearts and harps with a P. That is what you play with the harp. So if there are other hearts, the hearts of the angels and saints, we can thus easily see the most chaste heart of Saint Joseph as a harp through his union with the immaculate heart of Mary and with the sacred heart of Jesus. So we can see in the harp of King David a symbolic picture of the most chaste heart of Saint Joseph. So now we come to our conclusion. Saint Joseph the spouse of the Immaculate Conception, and I think this is a, a, a title, a way of understanding the sublime dignity of Saint Joseph, that he is the spouse of the Immaculate Conception. Sometimes we might miss that great dignity. If we call him the spouse of Mary, of course, but if you call him the spouse of the Immaculate Conception, it seems to make you think a little more. So Saint Joseph, the spouse of the Immaculate Conception, was prefigured in his fatherhood, in his virginity, and in his role as protector of Mary Most Holy. Through the different types and figures and symbols that prefigure Saint Joseph, we can understand better who Saint Joseph is, his greatness, his dignity, the role that he has towards us as well. We contemplated in the harp of King David the most chaste heart of Saint Joseph. The harp of Saint Joseph is a heart that plays a song that expresses his continual love for the Blessed Virgin Mary. All of his love and sacrifice is expressed through this song, which was continual, which he played through the harp of his most chaste heart. St. John Hughes also speaks about the Immaculate Heart as being like a thurible, what you put incense into. We can say a similar thing about the heart of Saint Joseph, that the incense that rises to the throne of God includes the incense of his continual imitation of Mary. If we think of Saint Joseph being so moved and inspired by her example that he strove to imitate her in everything, wanting to do things as she did them and wanting to, as it were, be and act as Mary, this continual imitation of Mary can help us to see St. Joseph as a model, an icon of the Marian vow. And there's a saint called St. Charbel, who's a Lebanese saint, whose baptismal name was Yusuf, which means Joseph in Arabic. His actions were described as being like a continual liturgy. So if you, um, on the 8th of December, you come to the, the Solemn Haimas and you watch the liturgy, his actions were like a continual liturgy. This can help us to think that if we strive to do everything in union with Mary and in imitation of Mary through the Marian vow, this vow can give us this, that continual incense and we can play the continual hymn of love through the harp that the Marian vow gives to us. With the Marian vow, we all have this harp. And we've said that this harp of Saint Joseph, which is his most chaste heart, can call many souls to a life of chastity. This harp of Saint Joseph, his most chaste heart, can also be a model and an inspiration for married couples, whereby the two hearts of the spouses become one single heart. That's what you should aim for. Aim at as couples to become one heart. Two hearts that become one heart that play the same canticle of love like the hearts of Mary and Saint Joseph. The two hearts becoming but one song. And this song of fidelity that God wants to come from the hearts of the faithful, directed as it were by the immaculate heart of Mary, forming 
one universal orchestra, one choir. So if our hearts are like a harp, Our Lady is the one that directs this choir. And God wants this song to rise to him. And it's the song of this fidelity. Let us hope that through the mediation of Saint Joseph, um, this can help bring about an era of peace. In these times where chastity is under attack, marriage and family are under attack, the religious life is under attack, the faith itself is under attack, we need to go to Saint Joseph to open these treasures of graces as the ancient Joseph, the son of Jacob, opened the granaries as the famine prevailed in the whole world. Let us go to Saint Joseph to help us with the restoration of the faith. Let us go to him to help establish the devotion to the Immaculate Heart of Mary in the world, to help restore England as Mary's dowry, bringing England back to the faith, to restore Casa Mariana, for those who know what that means, and other religious communities who have seen him, who have him as one of their patrons. In the end, it will be the Blessed Virgin Mary who will intervene. But there is a certain mediation that has been given to Saint Joseph for these times, through which he can mediate to us for his spouse, Mary the Mediatrix of all graces, in a similar way that Mardukai, whom we have said is a type and figure of Saint Joseph, mediated to Queen Esther, who is a type and figure of Mary. For in chapter four of the book of Esther, Mordecai sent word to Queen Esther, asking her to petition the king for the Jews, and Esther did this and the Jews were saved. In the last apparition of Fatima on October 13th, while the people saw the miracle of the sun, the children saw the Holy Family, our Lord during his passion, our Lady of Sorrows and our Lady of Mount Carmel. Sister Lucia describes the apparition of Saint Joseph with these words, quote, After Our Lady had disappeared into the immense distance of the firmament, we beheld Saint Joseph with the child Jesus, and Our Lady robed in white with a blue mantle beside the sun. Saint Joseph and the child Jesus appeared to bless the world, for they traced the sign of the cross with their hands, end quote. We need this blessing of Saint Joseph, the blessing of a father, in a similar way that Isaac blessed Jacob and Jacob blessed his 12 sons. We need the blessing of Saint Joseph to come upon this world and we can receive it through the most chaste heart of Saint Joseph. As this year of Saint Joseph comes to a close, let our devotion and love for him not decrease, but rather increase as St. Joseph would bring us to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Eater ad Joseph, go to Joseph, and he will open to us the heavenly granaries of Jesus, our universal King and Redeemer, and he will give to us all the treasures that have been stored in the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Amen.